Much like the characters that encompass it, Dragon Ball the franchise has reached the point in its life where it has reached a certain level of godliness. Between the sequels, movies, parodies, non-canonical side stories we just kind of humor at this point, not to mention the video games and plethora of other merch, it has become untouchable both as a cultural mainstay as well as within the fanbase itself. Goku can come out of the TV and slap your mom at this point and people will still be like, okay, but wait until the next movie. Die Hard set these unrealistically high expectations for what they want from the series going forward, makes this with a blind faith to accept anything Thing that comes out and it makes for this really unhealthy dynamic between art and consumer. Even before Daima came out, I'd see people picking apart every promo pic and logo to absolute shreds. The admittedly sparse promotion sending the fans into this rabid frenzy the second something does crop up. Like, chill out, did you ever have a boss micromanage you? Now just imagine that, but the guy doesn't even work there. So much of the absolute worst of the fandom is so willing to breathe down the necks of the creative staff involved in the next Dragon Ball entry, when they're essentially setting themselves up for disappointment at this point. Things have only further ballooned out of proportion when series creator Akira Toriyama died in March 2024, further lighting a fire underneath these types of fans, convinced that Dragon Ball Daima, as the final anime project under Toriyama's supervision, absolutely has to be this perfect end cap masterpiece encapsulating 30 plus years of lore and nostalgia into a single series. So when the Sandland manga, a Toriyama one-shot from 2000, was scheduled to get an anime movie in 2023, I felt like it had the perfect scenario of a generally unknown series getting an adaptation with zero unreasonable hype or expectations leading up to its release. And then it announced a video game to come out around the same time. And an anime. And the merge. <laughs> You had the perfect opportunity to set low expectations, only to put more and more of a spotlight on yourself. So when the movie premiered to lukewarm responses in Japan, so much so that Toriyama himself resorted to some proud begging to watch the film and boost its sales, I assumed the series would be dead in the water once it eventually came over to the States. And in some ways it was. It premiered on Hulu in the States, and Disney Plus in other countries, which, if you're familiar with either streaming service, are hot garbage when it comes to advertising their own anime. On the one hand, I was heartbroken that an adaptation of one of my favorite manga got passed over by weebs everywhere, but on the other, I was happy my relatively obscure favorite has remained just that. In part so I could put my own spotlight on it and assert my dominance as the sole alpha weeb with peak taste. Sandland the series perfectly encapsulates every Toriyamaism from his 45 year long career into the perfect 13 episode series, ripe with thematic and literal callbacks to his past works while still existing as its own very modest, very chill thing. Much like its original author and the old men written into the show itself, it exists at its own pace, in its own genre one of the few adventure series in a season still ripe with isekai and long-running shonen. You start with Beelzebub, a cocky demon child, picking a fight with a local law enforcement of the titular Sandland. Right off the bat, we realize that his reputation is a bit misleading as we find his crew of demons to be stealing water the king has dammed off for himself. Furthermore, his definition of evil is rather broad, as his list of evil deeds includes not brushing his teeth and sleeping in. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sheriff Rao exists as Beelzebub's and in turn the series anchor, allowing for Beelz to jump around and take down bad guys, all while Rao contains the series' core spirit, a literal human aspect to serve as the audience's gateway to what lies ahead. In a lot of ways, the rapport is akin to Bulma and Goku's in early Dragon Ball, with the general globetrotting adventure setup also feeling very familiar yet distinct. Toriyama has made a fair share of notable characters over the years, but a common thread among them is how they live almost deceptively contrary to their appearances. Whether it be pipsqueaks that pack a punch, weaklings that claim to be the world champion, or teenage girls proving to be knowledgeable mechanics in their own right, Toriyama has always enjoyed crafting these almost oxymoronic characters and unraveling the humor and drama in that initial contradiction. It's easy to find this in Beelzebub himself, but Rao also serves this to a near-depressing degree. So not. Initially serving as the reluctant literal sheriff to his demon tagalongs, he warms up to them over time until he finally admits to being a former soldier for the very king they're seeking to take down. Not only that, but he was the soldier sent to eliminate an entire race of people, the king sending out the false information that said race was making a weapon of mass destruction. What makes the Toriyama story so masterful is how he's able to take the same formula characters and pivot them in such unlikely directions, ranging from the straight man, the comic relief, or even the dramatic. And nothing exemplifies this more than this early scene between the core cast. 
Still getting to know each other, the scene opens with some idle chit-chat between Beelzebub and Rao. The two joke about how Beelzebub is technically thousands of years older than Rao, and Rao innocently asks about the good old days. Already the dynamic is challenged. Rao, the visibly older character, submits to the visibly younger Beelzebub, asking a question you would imagine from someone younger. He ignorantly posits that while humans have always had their problems, they've never been as bad as those that demons have had to deal with. To this, Beelzebub casually retorts, You're one to talk. We play tricks, but we don't kill. Not like you humans. This exchange speaks volumes. In such a short, casual delivery, Beelz is able to summarize the difference between humans and demons so succinctly, a dynamic that plays throughout the rest of the series. While demons have come to accept the status quo for what it is, humans feel the need to blame Sandland's forever drought on the demons themselves. A fundamental lack of understanding of the situation would be one thing, but it's another thing entirely to blame it all on a different species, all based on some misconceptions that have become only further internalized among humans over time. In the hands of anyone else, this would come off as heavy-handed and eye-roll worthy, and yet in the very capable hands of Toriyama, it's as simple and approachable as any other conversation. Rao even ending the scene with a simple admittance of the ignorance of humans, a small change towards a more hopeful future. So as the series continues, Rao does veer away from his Bulma archetype, and even the manga's own archetype for himself, becoming more of a swashbuckler in his own right. Where the manga has Rao more as the den mom playing alongside Beelzebub and Thief, anime Rao begins to take a more active approach come the end of the first arc. Where the most action manga Rao gets are some occasional tank jukes, anime Rao still proves he's more than willing to leap into action when the time comes. This is most apparent in his final standoff with Commander Zhu. This is basically that final fight scene in Up when you realize the finale is essentially between two old guys, but you know what? It works. In a technical manner, this change was definitely done as a means to better elevate the more low-key action scenes from the manga, but giving Rao a more active role not only allows for more possibilities for action, but as a character himself, it allows him to play a more active role in righting the wrongs he's committed in the past, now willing to put his life on the line to make things right, even when he could have just retreated into further obscurity after all these years. And it's not even mentioning the anime-exclusive second arc. The series' second arc, Forest Land, introduces a fourth character to round out the cast, Anne. She's a freedom fighter, working with other Resistance members to overthrow Forest Land's Crooked King. Similar to the first arc, the premise is relatively simplistic, and yet its success lies in its attention to detail. Every new character introduced this arc has some kind of Toriyamaism it's based on, and it's pulled off spectacularly every time. The Forest Land arc again makes for this familiar yet distinct adventure that's cozy without feeling completely derivative. It's that perfect middle ground that's not quite a Memberberry sequel or a full-on copy and paste either, that I think more media should take from. Forest Land serves as a sequel not just to Sandland, but a thematic sequel to every Toriyama story to come before it. Anne's story is heavily reminiscent to something you'd expect from a Dragon Quest or a Chrono Trigger. Muniel's increasing transformations have some serious Dragon Ball Z DNA in them, and smaller details like Beelzebub's metallic buff feel like less a cop-out and more just another fun quirky addition to a fun and quirky series. Even its weird amount of old guys in its main and supporting cast feels like something only a Toriyama story can pull off. You've got Rao and Zhu, not to mention Thief, R.A., Satan, Longo, Bread, and the absolute best boy, Papa Swimmer. This is probably the most old guys you're going to get in a shonen series, and they all exist to better flesh out the story and greater world. A world that serves just as big a character role as the rest of the cast. I mean, it's in the title. Unlike more typical shonen where the adults are bogged down by years of adulting to care about the world they've left the younger folk with, these adults are haunted by the mistakes they've made in the past, going full years, if not decades, living with these ghosts until they're given an opportunity to make things right. Where a younger protagonist would demand change come now, these older protagonists need to get themselves out of their years of trauma and apathy to convince themselves to finish what they started, to bring justice where they first brought pain and suffering. And that makes for an ultimately more engaging story. Sandlin the series holds a very different weight when realizing it was the last Toriyama project to be released in his lifetime. Suddenly a tried and true adventure series filled with an eclectic cast, spot on humor, and near obsessive tank fixations has served as a final love letter to one of the greatest cartoonists of our time. 
And while people will insist on those same expectations from Dragon Ball Daima, Sandland has what that series could never obtain, being able to live in relative obscurity. Even with an adaptation and the Toriyama name attached to it, Sandland will forever remain as that one series Toriyama worked on that wasn't Dragon Ball. But it's in that relative obscurity that it's able to flourish. Without a rabid fandom free package for the project, staff were able to work on the series free from any expectations besides their own. And I believe the final product shows this in every regard. Every character, every location, every fight scene, every stupid gag has that classic Toriyama energy. And it isn't out of any reverence to the source material or author, because plenty of its deviations from the manga somehow also had that same energy with it. Sandlin isn't a masterpiece because it places its author on a pedestal. It's a masterpiece because it just so happened to be. In the handful of interviews Toriyama has given over the years, he always emitted this mild-mannered energy about him. He wasn't an Oda type where he made sure to write his stories as an obsessive fan himself. If anything, he was as distant from his own works as humanly possible, while still somehow mustering the energy to still write and draw it. My favorite Toriyama interview snippet is this 2014 interview where he flat out admits that he would start tournament arcs not knowing who would win, and how he went out of his way to make Goku lose when fans wrote in expecting him to win. Even when he wrote the Sandland manga, he admitted he just wanted to make a short story about an old man in a tank, only for the story to grow more and more out of control with each chapter. Toriyama's genius is not in his ability to plan, but in his ability to accept what works and pivot away from what doesn't. It's an ethos so genius in its simplicity, and yet only someone as skilled as Toriyama could fall forward in the way he has time and time again. It's also bizarrely human in a way, an energy mirrored perfectly in Sandland the series. It's a story not tied down to decades of lore, and yet it's still able to reach such emotional peaks, captivating action, and a charming world all while expressing an unassuming hope for the future in a gang of unlikely heroes. When Akira Toriyama first began Dragon Ball in 1984, it was just a few months after his first smash hit Dr. Slump came to an end. Upon beginning this then-unproven Dragon Ball series, he admits, it wasn't received well. At the very beginning, there were something like anticipation votes in connection with my work on Dr. Slump, but right away my ranking in the reader surveys went towards the lower end. Today, 40 years after the Dragon Ball manga's premiere, we've reached the point where the series no longer has to prove itself, its status as a legend in the manga and anime world being uncontested among fans and casuals alike. But when you have a series so ingrained in the community, it becomes untouchably perfect, a product of godhood rather than the product of an author. And I believe Toriyama became conscious of this very early into the series' run. Pre-Z era, Goku fights against his then-enemy Piccolo. Afterwards, Piccolo's good half, Kami, offers to step down as Earth's god, delegating the role to Goku instead. Without so much as a minute to think about it, Goku refuses the role outright, and time and time again, we see Goku do this with gods of higher and higher rank. Not because he'd be bad at it, but because with status comes expectations. And if you're someone like Goku, there is nothing more limiting than a lack of having to prove yourself. So be like Goku. Reject godhood. Life is better suited for the mortals. And in some cases, the demons.